Hello there and welcome to another episode of Talk Music Talk with Boyce. I am Boyce and this is my podcast you are listening to. Talk Music Talk is a weekly music interview podcast where I have long form conversations with people connected to music from different genres and different backgrounds, both established and emerging. And on this episode, I met this guest at Rockwood Music Hall here in New York City for a performance by a past TMT guest, Camila, episode number 99. You should check that out. His name is Leo Manzari. He is a tap dancer, a singer, a rapper, an actor, originally from D.C., based in Brooklyn currently. He started dancing when he was two years old, and since then he's been working on his dream of being in multiple disciplines. In this conversation, we talk about tap, of course, him learning the craft, his tap style, how he decided to connect his music to tapping. We also talk about career highlights like working with Maurice Himes and acting on Homeland. Also, you will get his thoughts on putting your art out and letting it go. He talks about learning to tap with his vision versus for someone else's. He gets into his influences and we talk about his album Clockwork, which came out last year. After the conversation, you will hear On Your Mind from Clockwork. And I will put this show up there with some of my favorite episodes. I know you will love it. We recorded this at the Susan Batson Studio in Midtown, where Leo studies acting. And here it is, without further ado, my conversation with Leo Manzari. Enjoy. So you teach tap, right? Yeah, I teach okay. tap and I perform tap dance. Okay. So for teaching tap, can uh, anyone learn tap? Yeah, I think you need an open mind. And mm-hmm. I think you have to be patient with yourself because there's a lot of repetition involved. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, I think if you're determined to learn your body, learn your psyche, your spirit, yeah. all that, I think you, you can learn it. Okay. So these people who want to learn tap for what? Exercise or uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> for a workout or people people get into tap dance for like various reasons, mm-hmm. but you know, the census that I hear a lot is isn't that I currently tap dance, is I used to tap dance. Okay. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people feel the wear and tear and the you know, just the commitment it takes and mm-hmm. you know, end up giving it up. But I think that if if it depends on what you're interested in, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like if you want to learn a basic time step for the sake of an after school, you know, yeah. thing to occupy your time, that's fine. Whereas if you wanted to really dive into the the art form of tap mm-hmm. dance, it just takes a little more commitment. Okay, so so what would be uh, the goal of somebody's like you know I just want to like work out. Yeah, and I, I have would two s- left feet. <laughs> <laughs> I would say uh, don't tap this. I'm just okay. kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, 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 no. What no, I don't know actually, your lane. Right? <laughs> what I would actually say is you know what I'm saying just you know find find your your voice within the art form and do mm-hmm. as best as you can. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So what's some of the wear and tear that can take place from? So first off, just the the constant rhythmic patterns going through your brain when you're mm-hmm. working on something. You know, it doesn't just end when you're supposed to be done with the rest of the, you know, rest of the class. You know, the the things you learn in a class setting mm-hmm. carry on into the next day. It carries on in your sleep. Okay. It carries on when you're trying to focus on something else. Mm-hmm. So that's just like, it's just very psychologically taxing. Yeah. Um, which I love that. Like, that's mm-hmm. part of why I like it. But also the physical aspect of it, too. Um, a lot of tap dancers suffer from different injuries, mm-hmm. um, just like all, all styles of dance do as well. But tap is typically hard on the knees, on the lower back, mm-hmm. on the ankles. Um, but there are specific techniques and uses of the floor that can enable you to not injure yourself yeah. if you work more off the rebound of the floor rather than diving directly into the floor mm-hmm. each time. But it takes some time to learn that. Like for me, when I was a kid, I would just go hard, you yeah. know, because I was like, my body feels great. Uh-huh. And then I think it was when I hit like 19 or 20 mm-hmm. where I was like, yep, I should probably. Yeah. You already <laughs> start feeling like the long. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, st- I started feeling it, you know, pretty young. But not to the point where it was like I like tore my ACL yeah, and I yeah. couldn't do it. You know what I'm saying? It was just like I started to have aches and pains where it was it acted as a subtle reminder, like, okay, you know, take care of your mm-hmm. take care of your body. You know, and I deal with different things here and there, but it, it switches, you know, from time to time. But again, technique is the key. Okay. Explain the psychological 
tear and wear and tear. Yeah. So essentially, you know, um, like if you're working on a piece of choreography that you're you're due to um, to perform, mm -hmm. you know, it's just you. There's lots of rehearsal hours contributed to to make sure that the piece is is good. Mm -hmm. So, but that's, you know, that's with anything, um, but that's at least my experience in tap. Also, the the constant um, flipping of polyrhythms and different, uh, like, say, if I'm working off of a, a paradiddle, right, which is a very common term used amongst drummers and tap mm -hmm. dancers, you don't just always put the emphasis on the one you know if you're counting one two three four yeah a paradiddle could start with the emphasis on the one but it mm -hmm. could also start as one two three four okay. or it can go one two three four mm -hmm. or it can go one two three four okay. right Depending so I, you stress it exactly okay. so i can go one two three four one two three four one two three four one two mm -hmm. three four you know and just like once you're learning that that mm -hmm. that that rhythmic pattern and just the mathematical sequence it's hard to escape it it's okay. kind of addicting honestly because uh -huh. you just really want to figure it out you want to learn all the ins and outs about how rhythm can work and mm -hmm. then how you can place it in your foot it's it's really a lifelong pursuit that's why when i talk to tap dancers that have been doing it for you know 20 years mm -hmm. plus like both me and my brother have and so you know a few uh, so many other tap dancers that i respect you know it's it's a huge it's a huge commitment so yeah. somebody's still tap dancing after 20 years you got to give it up to mm -hmm. them when did you start tapping i started dancing uh when i was like two okay you know as much as you can do in a class yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know my mom put my sister in it first who's my oldest sibling then my brother and then me um and then i it's really just i just stuck with it mm -hmm. and luckily when i was 14 i had a, a performance uh opportunity uh, with a man named Maurice Hines, who yeah, yeah, took yeah. me under his wing and really gave me the platform to to f find my voice through the mm -hmm. dance and to not only tap dance, but to expand into music and acting, which are yeah. my other passions. So, yeah, I've been doing it for, for a very long time. Okay. Yeah. So what does it start like with basic? Is it called tap or is it like, is that yeah. jazz? Or? Um, well, tap dance as an art form is mm -hmm. derivative of jazz music. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it came out of that style of music in terms of swing yeah and in terms of you know pocket steps and being able to improvise i feel you're not fully a tap dancer until you have confidence within improvisation mm -hmm. because tap dance isn't just a series of steps that you learn and perform yeah tap dance is finding your own route uh to to express yourself mm -hmm. You know, so the only way you can figure out how to do that is if you learn to improvise and fail and fail and fail mm -hmm. until you succeed. Um, and that is what I love about the tap dance, yeah. the, the, the tap dance art form. So, yeah, you know, so it was really popular in the 1920s, 30s during the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. You see it at the Apollo Club, uh, the Apollo Theater and the Cotton Club. Um, you see it in all of these different contexts. And especially back then. You know, um, just performers in general would always have to, you know, have their own niche to kind yeah. of bring them to the forefront. And so a lot of tap dancers you have as, uh, you know, they, they have very powerful identifiers. You know, mm -hmm. you have Sandman Sims, who was yeah. very famous for uh, putting sand on the ground and using the friction of the sand mm -hmm. to create sound as opposed to the striking of the floor. Um, and then you have Jimmy Slide, you know, who could slide for mm -hmm. days and was just incredibly agile. Um, and then you have Sammy Davis Jr., who's the tricks of all trade, who's somebody that I study a lot and who I respect a lot and who I, I model myself after loosely, mm -hmm. not for how he did each art form, just the concept and the idea of thinking that you don't have to limit yourself to one art form. Okay. Um, yeah, that's kind of, you know, so tap mm -hmm. dance is just full of like a bunch of individuals that really worked hard to become yeah. good at something. And then <laughs> they made a career off of it when yeah. all odds were against them. So for the improvisation, is it like jazz where like you tap a theme and then you improv yeah. and come back to the theme? Yeah, um, it should be. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you know, there's some people who like to go out there and just, you know, execute it freely mm -hmm. without any any structure they just kind of like to you know um express themselves however they might uh see fit for me I, I i because i'm a musician um my improvisation 
is less about visually stimulating steps like mm-hmm. crazy turns or splits and stuff which which i did do growing up and yeah. i still do now depending if like if i'm on an orchestra gig and i have to be big and flashy for like mm-hmm. a concert hall of three thousand people then obviously i'm gonna pull that out yeah. right but if i'm just improvising with the intimacy of a band uh you typically learn the head you learn the head of the tune which is the melody of the mm-hmm. course and and then you find pockets of space in between that to to branch off rhythmically yeah but you always come back to the head yeah you know it's kind of okay. like the beginning middle and end of the of a story okay so yeah. it'd be like uh my funny valentine so it'd be da 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 mm-hmm God, I just completely. No, oh, that was great. Bye. <laughs> okay, so yeah. that'd be the theme. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And then you go off and do your own thing. Yeah, exactly. And then come back. To come it. back to it. Yep. Okay. Come back. And how does someone teach you improvisation? Well, that's that's a good question. So mm-hmm. first off, you have to learn your vocabulary. Okay. What's and that? when I when I say vocabulary, I mean okay, like what is a shuffle uh, shuffle ball change? Mm-hmm. What is a paradiddle? What is a um, you know, just you have to learn all of the specific okay. details and how to execute and make sound with your foot. Mm-hmm. Once you have that, I call that your toolbox. And once you have your toolbox, is at that point, it's on you to figure out what you want to build. Mm-hmm. So then you figure out if you want to build, you know, if you want to build a, a hip hop house yeah. or if you want to build a, a jazz uh-huh. jazz club or if you want to build something that's straight Afro-Cuban. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? What is it that you want to build? Yeah. And um, once you have the toolbox and you identify what you want to build, then you start learning the pockets of space within the music that you should be filling um, with your tap dance. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once you have the rhythmic and even melodic structure for a tap dance, a melody is within rhythm, which a lot of people think, mm-hmm. you know, melody is just notes on a keyboard. Yeah. But tap dancers should think melodically, too. You know, mm-hmm. there's a difference between a high pitched heel and a low pitched heel. So once you have all of that, then you start applying the visual aspect of it. So I always execute music first mm-hmm. and then apply the visual aspect of it. And I choreograph a lot for various studios, particularly yeah. in New Jersey and a few in L.A. And whenever I do that, I I always make sure I listen to the music like a million times mm-hmm. before I even put my shoe on to try to choreograph. Because what I found is that the, the step is always always without fail the Mm -hmm. step is always within the music okay always yeah it's just you have to focus long enough to find it Mm -hmm. okay so you have your vocabulary how do you then learn to improv to execute it yeah well then once you have your vocabulary you figure out which house you want to build and then you figure out how rhythm and music works then you start meeting other artists Mm -hmm. and combining your two creative voices so for me i started to learn how to improv by like improvising with other musicians Mm -hmm. you know who don't come from where i come from and then i have to make sure i uh i emphasize the idea of having a conversation so if i'm then I, you know, I just posted a video on my Instagram where I did something with drums and, mm-hmm. and tap. We were just going head to head. The only reason we were able to build an arc that felt like a musical yeah. arc, even though we were improvising, was because we were listening to each other. Mm-hmm. You know, if he said hello, I mm-hmm. would say hello. Okay. If like he jazz said, musicians do. exactly. Yeah. You know, you're not going. If if I say how are you, you're not going to mm-hmm. be like cheeseburger. You know, <laughs> like bro, you hungry, bro? Like you good? <laughs> you're not going to do that, right? Yeah. I have to be relative to whatever uh-huh. you are trying to tell me. Okay. Um, and then once you're able to do that. The key thing of, you know, first off, the way you're able to do that is by listening. That's the key thing. A lot of uh, I've spoken to a lot of students and they feel that they have to to do the most and constantly being be it, be able to say something. Mm-hmm. Whereas the only reason we know what to say is to human beings is because it's in response to something yeah. we've heard. Okay. So listen first. Okay, because that's yeah. like with uh, as we were talking about before we start recording, acting improv is that yeah. you have to be a good good listener. Exactly, like yeah. people are bad listeners or yeah, don't then, do well in that. No, you yeah. will not make a dime <laughs> in acting if you can't listen. And like also, you know, there's a common phrase. <clears throat> we're actually doing this at the Susan Bassin Studio, yeah. which is my acting studio. I've been here for like three years, and one of the main common things that we uh, any improviser knows in acting is the, the term yes and yes, yes you know is you're you're accepting what somebody offers mm-hmm. to you within the scene and then you're contributing something with an and the conjunction of and yeah. so if you're like okay um, 
man, you know, I really wanted to go to the pool. I'm be like, you know what? Yeah. And you know what? On top of that, we're going to buy some hot dogs on the way. Okay. You know, and then I'm able to push the scene forward. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing musically. If somebody throws me, you know, if, if we're in a 4-4 four, four meter and somebody throws me a polyrhythm that's in 3-4 for yeah. like two bars, I'm not going to disregard that. I'll probably mm-hmm. throw it right back at them. Okay. And then after I do two bars of 3-4, I might throw something in 5-4. Mm-hmm. That's my ant. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, just building that. blocks. I get that. Yeah. Were there things when you were coming up and learning it that were particular sticky for you to learn? Yeah, uh, the idea of learning. <laughs> Straight up. Like, I'm a very, I wouldn't say now, because, like, again, like, I just had to learn to listen. Yeah. And, and really, like, you, you know, have a neutral stance when I'm receiving information. But when I was younger, man, I, it was, I, I was a slow learner. Mm-hmm. Like, it was hard for me to, to watch somebody do a step and then for me to just pick it up. Yeah. You know, I was always creative. I could always make shit and, mm-hmm. like, make it look cool. But when it came to me just receiving information, yeah. that was very hard for me. And my brother, I credit a lot because he would, you know, we had a duo act called the Manzari Brothers, mm-hmm. which, you know, we still do from time to time. But I did it primarily from like 14 to 20. Yeah. And in that time, a lot of it consisted of like him, like reteaching me stuff okay. <laughs> that like I forgot, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Or like if we're choreographing, I would be able to spit out a step. And I wouldn't remember what I did, but he would remember it. Mm-hmm. He would pick it up, and then he would teach teach it back to me. Okay, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So that was probably my biggest uh, obstacle as mm-hmm. a performer, and just as an artist in general, is like, or as a, as a human being, because mm-hmm. even in math, like my biggest enemy are word problems. Yeah, yeah. I hated word problems, yeah, yeah. and I think it was just because it was so much information being mm-hmm. given to me in a way that I didn't know how to dissect it. You know, I was looking at the wrong things. Okay. You know, I would go straight to the numbers as opposed to like whatever word was explained in the Mm -hmm. description of like where the numbers came from. But that was just me having to learn how to listen. Okay. And then, which is why acting helped me a lot because, you know, there's a stance actors neutral where you sit, you receive Mm -hmm. in order to give off your emotion after the fact. And the more I polished my tool of like okay this is how i listen yeah that's what enabled me to find freedom and be efficient with what i produced Mm -hmm. okay and when did uh maurice hines come into the picture and what did you learn from him man everything Mm -hmm. man like maurice hines i credit him even the stuff that i like didn't do with him on the bill Mm -hmm. i still credit everything i do to maurice hines yeah um he came into the picture when i was 14 turning 15 um, my best friend, my best friend's mom got a uh, email for the flyer that he was teaching mm-hmm. a master class in DC. So me and my brother rolled through and he was holding an audition the next day for the, a rendition of sophisticated ladies at the Lincoln theater. Yeah. Um, which was a show he had started many years prior. Mm-hmm. That's why it was a huge deal that he was coming back to it and doing it in one of the dopest theaters in DC, mm-hmm. which is the Lincoln theater. And he saw us at the the master class and then asked us to come to the audition. I was young, so mm-hmm. like it, and it was an equity show, so they were having a little trouble like getting me in it. But he put in that work, and I don't know magically. Yeah. I don't want to say magically, but like they figured out a way to finesse me to get my equity card, mm-hmm. and I got my equity card off of that show. Yeah, yeah. There's still some people that I talk to now that have been in show business for like 15 years, and mm-hmm. they don't have their equity card. Um, but Maurice, you know, he made it happen. And not only did he put us in the show, but I had my own route in the show as, you know, like I was, we were credited the Menzari mm-hmm. brothers, but then I was also swinging that show. Are you, are you familiar? No, no, what's that? So swinging, yo, I have the biggest respect for anybody that is a swing. Uh-huh. Basically, you're an understudy for everybody in the show. Okay, everybody. Or for a designated amount of people mm-hmm. in the show. So it was me and this other girl named Kirsten. Yeah. And Kirsten, you know, she was older than me. I was 14, so she was mm-hmm. probably like, I don't know, she was like 26. So she yeah, had been yeah. doing it. She was prepared. She uh-huh. came She came in with a binder. Uh-huh. She came in with like, and it was like color coordinated too yeah, yeah. and like highlighted and like all this stuff, like really mapping out where everybody went mm-hmm. and the formations, who kicked on one, yeah. who threw their arm on two who did a split on three okay. you know all of this stuff which i didn't <laughs> i didn't know yeah. how to do. and i was literally just telling you that like it was hard for me to learn yeah, at this yeah. point so like it was like 
it was one of the best challenges of my life mm-hmm. though because I had to learn everybody's part and figure out how I processed information. Yeah. Um, so yeah, not only what did I have my part as a Manzari brother in the show, mm-hmm. but I was also a swing for okay. all of the male dancers. Mm-hmm. Um, how many was that? That was like, dog, that was like five, yeah, yeah. five or six. So you have to know everybody's part. Yeah, okay. you have to know everybody's part. And the thing is, is like, you don't even get like three days notice yeah. on who, you know, if somebody injures themselves mm-hmm. during act one. Okay. You are on an act two. <laughs> <laughs> and you better know what you're doing. Uh-huh. And you better know how to like quickly get in that costume. Yeah. You know, and change into the next one. It's just like it throw it threw me in the fire. Yeah. And I was just like, all right, I better learn how to how to finesse this, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Um so yeah, and he gave us like this whole duo section. There's a song called Coco that he actually cut out mm-hmm. from the second act and build it as all right, this is gonna be the Menzari Brothers yeah, time for yeah. like ten minutes. Okay. And he didn't choreograph it. He helped us with, you know, little things here because he's a performer, so he really knows how to polish off mm-hmm. a performance piece and guarantee a standing ovation. Those are the things that he gave us is like, do this here and I guarantee mm-hmm. you they'll stand and then somehow they stand yeah, yeah. and you're like, Wow. Um, but yeah he gave us like a designated 10 minutes in that show for us to just do us mm-hmm. and man I, I never take that yeah, for granted yeah. what did you learn about yourself from doing that besides the fact that you could learn yeah. different parts like <clears throat> man well I learned why I was in school in the first place because mm-hmm. I was in ninth grade I was a freshman in high school during this period of time and before I was in school and you know obviously like I would work hard and mm-hmm. you know you know, and I always knew that I wanted to dance and be a performer. But what that gave me was like a complete look into the professional realm yeah. of what performance life would look like mm-hmm. for me. And I mean, my school, which is the field school, I shout them out because they were the most accommodating mm-hmm. in this situation. A lot of people stop there or a lot of schools I've heard stop their talent from entering into long time commit- committed things because yeah. it takes them away from school. Okay. And my school knew they were like, OK, yeah, this will take you away. But this is an incredible opportunity yeah, for you. you Why would we this. stop you? Yeah. You know, we'll help you get through it. Mm-hmm. So they ended up, you know, I ended up doing my freshman year home homework until two weeks Mm -hmm. before my sophomore year started okay you know what i'm saying i was working through the whole summer yeah and they like they hooked up the tutor like everything bro Uh like they they really looked out to me for me so like shout out to the field school so like i learned why i was being educated in the first place by doing that show i was like okay i want to go to school to to get the skill set and like writing Mm -hmm. and obviously mathematics science get what i need to know and i know exactly how i'm gonna apply it when i graduate high school because i had this professional experience okay yeah and that show like man people people sleep on that show but that mm-hmm. show is like selling out the lincoln theater dog oh, really? like, yeah like yeah. they um and we closed like we had two extended uh extended deadlines yeah. because popular demand mm-hmm. and then we ended up closing for like some various reasons but on the week of us closing like the line was like around the corner man. yeah like yeah, that was incredible. really an impactful show for yeah. for dc so to be a part of that and you know to be to have that my introduction w- you know with my brother to maurice mm-hmm. like that was crazy yeah. at that age did you have to deal with any like stage fright or anything like that man so i'm i'm kind of i'm kind of weird dog mm-hmm. like i'm like <sighs> see i think it's because i've like been on stage my whole life yeah that Yes, you could argue it's stage fright, but it's never been like, I don't want to do this. Okay. It's always been like, let's see how this goes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Like, bro, like, I, I, look, I've broken my ankle on stage. Mm-hmm. I've had the worst stomach ache on stage. I've had the biggest headache on stage before. Like, yeah. I've, I've had, like, an in, like crazy injuries on stage. Like, mm-hmm. a lot has happened to me on stage over my life that... Like, even back then, it was just kind of like, what's going to stop me? Like, yeah, yeah. even if I go out there and, like, I slip and bust my ass, it's like, mm-hmm. I'm probably going to get up, do a turn, do a split, get the fuck back yeah. up, and then do what I need to do after that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, you know, so I would get butterflies, but nothing that would ever, like, stop me from wanting yeah, to go out. Yeah, yeah that's natural. Yeah, because, yeah. I, I mean, I love performing, man. And I, I love offering, my, you know, what I can to the world. Like, I... 
I'm not a lawyer, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not some, you know, I'm not an incredibly uh, educated doctor that mm-hmm. will, you know, help break through um, any scientific mystery, you know, yeah. so it's like, what can I, what, <laughs> yeah. can, what can I offer? I, but it's like, it's like, what can I offer, man? And I've always, I've always struggled with that. It's like, all right, what is like my worth? What is my worth when I, when I die? Like when mm-hmm. I'm not here, what are people going to say about me? Yeah. It's like, what can I contribute that's outside of just my experience mm-hmm. of living? And for me, performing is just, you know, that little thing that I can offer. Yeah. When did you figure that out? From a young age. Okay. And I think, you know, because, you know, we're talking a lot about tap, but, you know, music has been my love as well mm-hmm. since, like, right around the time I was tap dancing, too. So, and I think it's been this inescapable uh, need to express mm-hmm. what was going on with me. Because if I held everything in my head, yeah, I feel yeah. like that would have disabled me from moving forward and mm-hmm. progressing just as a human being. You know, like for me, I don't sit down and say, I'm going to write a song mm-hmm. to serve this purpose. It's like, I need to get this off my chest. So let me put it out. Yeah, yeah. And then what ends up happening is then, and this is what I've noticed over time is just people find their own connection to it. And it ends up serving a purpose that I hadn't anticipated. Mm-hmm. And that's that is very rich and sweet when you don't do something to to impress or you don't do it to to in an effort to connect with people, mm-hmm. but somehow it magically does. Yeah. That's why I love doing what I do. Yeah. Cause it's like if you're putting that authentic part of yourself out, people will respond to that. Yeah. And you know, someone's always watching you, you don't know what they're gonna get from it. Yeah. But you can always kinda of control being authentic exactly yeah and like one one thing that this studio actually helped me learn is like once you create the art piece Mm -hmm. and you and you give it out it is no longer yours yeah yeah and that's been something that i still like sometimes struggle with it's like am i cool with that like but at the end of the day you have to be generous with your art Mm -hmm. and if you're not willing to be generous with your art then it's like don't try to do art within the industry yeah it's like you can do art like go to go to a cabin in the middle of Mm -hmm. maine you know what i'm saying yeah and like create your art there and then if you if you really want to ha- possess your art fully 100 percent, do it there it'll mm-hmm. be yours but i feel like there's a certain level of um acceptance that an artist has to have with the fact that when you're creating in an industry context one it, once it is out mm-hmm. the bottom line is it's not 100 percent yours yeah and all you could do at that point is is pray that you are connecting with people in a positive mm-hmm. light in a positive manner okay yeah that's nice that's nice so when did you you mentioned sammy davis showed you that you know you can do many different things Mm -hmm. when did you decide that i can do the tap i can do music i can yeah i can act so the that's that's also let me try to think about this before i just start talking uh (laughs) i would say for tap dance and and music both of Mm -hmm. those were like isolated forms of expression Mm -hmm. like i'd never tried to connect those when i was in high school you know people would tell me you know oh that would be cool if you did you know but i didn't feel the the creative or artistic impulse Mm -hmm. to feel like i would do it justice if i tried to do that so it wasn't until i because i went to emerson college for a year and a half Mm -hmm. where i was an acting bfa major and when I left and came to to New York, that's when I started to fully feel like, okay, like I feel like I've progressed enough in each individual art form to then mm-hmm. bring it together without um without um like pimp for lack of better words, pimping out the other art form. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like how can I keep both authentic even though it is in fact a combination? Mm-hmm. Um, and the guys I really credit with giving me the platform and time to figure out what that formula is, is my band. Um, I met them. They all went to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I was the only cat in the band that didn't go to Berkeley, but we all met there and we were all just working on our sound together. You know, these are cats that just went to, you know, Berkeley from various parts and walks Mm -hmm. of life you know, various parts of the, of the country and they're working on their instrumental sound and they gave me the platform to, to work on my vocals and work on, you know, how I want to give my story mm-hmm. and then eventually how, how I wanted to tap dance in the context with them. Because up until I started tap dancing with my band, I was tap dancing for like a, a lot of union gigs, theater yeah. shows. It was very much theater tap dance in the sense of like, 
you know, uh, song and dance. Mm-hmm. It was rooted in jazz. The show I grew up with and toured for like six years of my life was called Maurice Hines is Tapping Through Life, which is a one man show of his life. Mm-hmm. And then it features me and my brother as a tap dance act at the end. So it was cool. I was tap dancing, but I was serving a purpose in, in, in his vision and yeah. Maurice's vision. So I was like, all right, like, how can I really start tap dancing with my vision? Mm-hmm. You know, my my full 100 percent vision without, you know, and not a disregard for it everything i learned from maurice is just more so an evolution of myself yeah, yeah. and uh yeah so once i started doing this fusion of tap dance and vocals that's when i started to really realize the power of like what they did together mm-hmm. if it's done right you know i've seen i've seen you know there there are people who try different formulas and try to mix certain things um, which I, I, I am a huge supporter of innovation, mm-hmm. but I'm only a supporter of innovation if it comes from the tools of knowing like how to do what's already been done. Yeah. You know, yeah. like I study the I study the great tap dancers. Mm-hmm. You know, what I'm saying I'm not trying to do something innovative off the bat. It's like, let me figure out how to do what y'all already know mm-hmm. how to do to the best of my ability before I offer something. OK. Yeah. So that's what that's what I'm trying to do now. Okay, cool. And so when did the Homeland, you were acting on that, yeah. and your album, Clockworks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, when did all that... My man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so Homeland uh, came about, I want to say, two, two, two years ago, mm-hmm. two, three years ago. Um, that's a crazy story. Basically, I didn't have an agent, didn't have a manager, um, and I went out for this audition, uh you know susan batson advocated for me Mm -hmm. considering i've been training under her and we have a very close relationship um she advocated for me i went in front of the casting director and i auditioned at like well first off they emailed me on thursday at like 10 30 p.m yeah like sent me two sides where i had to learn like three pages for each scene and then i had to do it at 11 a.m the next Uh day on friday (laughs) so i went and i did that and then at 5 p.m., I was actually recording a song, and I was in the middle of a vocal take, uh-huh. which man, I had, was a nice vocal take because yeah. I was messing it up for like three times before, uh-huh. and I was like, this is finally the one. <laughs> and then in the middle of the take, my phone starts ringing. Mm-hmm. Lyrics disappear, and my phone starts ringing. I'm like, who the hell? Like, who's yeah, yeah. calling me right now? <laughs> and then I answer it. Take. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I was like bad about the take. Uh-huh. And then I answer the phone. They're like, you got the part. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, what? So, man, that all happened in a day. Mm-hmm. And then I got the part, like I said, 5 p.m. on Friday. And then I didn't get the script till Monday. Okay. And then I, I studied the script. And then Wednesday um, is when I shot the first scene. Um, and that was actually the biggest scene with mm-hmm. Claire Danes because my, my, I have a very controversial role. So it's, I don't want to give it away, but yeah. essentially it leads up to a point where I am kind of cornered mm-hmm. um, by Claire Danes, who might I add is an incredible actress, incredibly professional to work with. And I just have a huge respect for her. Um, yeah. And that was my that was my first scene. So it was the most climactic scene mm-hmm. of, the, of the of my time on Homeland. But so that was fun, man. Yeah, that was yeah. cool. I was a recurring role. I was on like four episodes. That's excellent. And shit. Excellent. It was cool. So yeah. when did, uh, how did you decide to do the album? Yeah. What was the process for that? So, you know, I I mentioned uh just my guys, my band that mm-hmm. I've been building with. And we had been working on a bunch of original tunes for, for like years. Yeah. And um we had put out what basically we went under a name a, a larger version of the band went under a name called all b mm-hmm. and all b we put out um two records one called the beacon one was called corners mm-hmm. both are still out um and then i took uh, a smaller section of that band and created this record called clockwork and i wasn't even like i don't want to say i wasn't ready to record it it's just mm-hmm. recording a record was not on my mind okay. because there's a lot that goes into yeah, recording yeah. a record not just psychologically but financially Mm -hmm. so i was like "Mm." so we were rehearsing one day and then my band was just like yo like why don't we laying this down yeah and it's a huge commitment of them too so i was kind of like i wasn't trying to ask you know it Mm -hmm. it, basically they just had to be like yo like when are you trying to lay this down i was like all right cool let's do it and we ended up recording it for like a period of time of uh, like six months Mm -hmm. i think um which is a very quick time to do an album um when i speak to some of the people that 
I live with in New York or that I know by living in New York, like some of them take like two to three years. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's like once I had the support of my team to be like, we want to make this record, I was like, I'm going to make this record happen. And I have the support from them because, um, you know, I have studio space that I can that I can get from a discounted Mm -hmm. rate. And they really just help me bring it to life. So Clockwork is essentially uh, the it's an eight track album um, flows from beginning Mm -hmm. to end. Um, And it's basically me speaking about um, my ops, my internal obstacles, figuring out who I am um, and painting it in a context of different uh different uh stories you know so the first song called clockwork which is the title track is actually about three astronauts who go out Mm -hmm. into outer space but it's a specific moment when they do that it's Mm -hmm. the moment right before they're about to take off yeah and they're able to see their kids and their wives Mm -hmm. on the tarmac beneath them and they're able to see exactly what it is they're sacrificing in light of the things they're trying to chase yeah. and trying yeah. to achieve and what comes with that. Mm-hmm. If you're going to achieve greatness, that, that's not just you achieving greatness. That's you like battling a bunch of things, mm-hmm. making a lot of sacrifices. You know, there's a lot that comes with that. Yeah. yeah. So every song kind of speaks of, of the, the concept of time and whether it's the right time, the wrong time. But at the end of the day, you got to keep moving mm-hmm. forward. Okay. What was standing in your way? Yeah. Um, <laughs> good question. <laughs> Y'all listen to the record, man. I'm just kidding. Um, well, I think at that point I was going through a transitional period because uh, my brother and I had been working together mm-hmm. so closely as the Manzari brothers, and I really wanted to branch out and yeah. and explore who I was as a musician um, and just finding my own identity. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's interesting because I feel, and I've you know maybe I'm just speaking from my experience, but. For me, when I classified success or I saw people uh, who had a, quote, successful brand in Mm -hmm. the performance industry, I feel like I had a tendency to feel like they had it all figured out. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like if you see somebody on on the TV screen or you hear somebody's music on the Mm -hmm. radio, it's like they're winning. They must be feeling good all the time. (laughs) You know, or if even, only. yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. Or like you see people that establish such a big, powerful brand and then mm-hmm. they're still unhappy, and you're just like, but don't you have this thing going for you? And I've realized that a lot of things that we see on the surface mm-hmm. level is actually not transparent to, transparent enough for us to see what's going on yeah, beneath that. Yeah. And for me, I had had this, you know, successful brand with my brother, the Mazar Brothers. It wasn't failing by any mm-hmm. means. Like, we were like, and we still are like if you're talking in terms of brother acts yeah. like there are lots of people who know us um but in terms of my full creative artistic mm-hmm. voice being being heard in that context it was it was impossible yeah because the bottom line is the manzari brother act is a tap dance act mm-hmm. but i'm way more than a tap dancer yeah yeah so i just i was going through really taking ownership of who i was and who i wanted to be mm-hmm Okay, and that is complex because it's your brother. Yeah, and you want to do other things outside of yeah, yeah, thing yeah. With your brother, and he was, you know, he had his reasons too. Mm-hmm. He wanted to do other shit too. It was just like, man. I mean, if you think about it, like you're with somebody, you know, what I'm saying, like every day, yeah, yeah, since since birth, and then and then when you know, at the time when we really started working as a brother team, which was like thirteen, fourteen, mm-hmm. it's like y'all are together like all the time. You live mm-hmm. together. You work together. You know, Christmas dinners aren't just Christmas dinners. Yeah. Christmas dinners are like, yeah, but let's talk about this contract that mm-hmm. we got to sign in a minute. Okay. You know, it's like it's 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 com- it's complex. Yeah, yeah. But throughout that entire experience of working with him, which I'm so grateful for, and I think he's a great person, is it it taught me patience and it taught me um, how to value other people's values mm-hmm. um, and how to communicate. Communication is key. Yeah. Um, and that translated into my success with the band. You know what I'm saying? Like, the only reason we as a collective are able to exist is because we can communicate. Mm-hmm. You know, if something is bothering me, everybody always tells me I wear my heart on my sleeve. Yeah. And I've never been ashamed of that. Um, because if something's bothering me, I'm going to tell you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you yeah, know what yeah. I'm saying? Or like, if you're hurting, if I uh-huh. can tell you're hurting and feeling some type of way, I'm going to ask you what's going mm-hmm. on. If you don't do that and if you're only in pursuit of this, quote, dream of becoming a, quote, famous musician, it's like, bro, like, where's the humanity, dog? Mm -hmm. Like, where's the humanity? 
that's what I like, the humanity aspect okay. of it. Okay, great, man. And you have the singles out? Yeah, Are I got some things. Out? I have one called For Everything that's mm-hmm. currently on like Spotify and Apple Music and all those platforms. I have uh, another single coming out called Nighttime, which mm-hmm. is coming out on June 28th. Okay. And then a series of other singles that will be released through the summer, which will eventually collectively make an EP. Mm-hmm. All of these singles are very special to me because they're all derivative of, um, you know, a relationship that I had had, a long distance yeah. relationship, um, which, you know, I don't know how many people are hip to how hard it is to mm-hmm. get a visa, but okay, yeah. uh, a visa kind of uh, disabled somebody who I care truly deeply mm-hmm. about to, to to follow her dreams. Yeah. And this this record kind of speaks on the, the harshness of that. Um, the beauty and being able to maintain something mm-hmm. um, even when the circumstances don't enable you to do it yeah. easily. Um, that's what all of, all of these songs are about. Mm-hmm. So this music is probably more, or it's not probably, it is mostly geared towards women. Yeah. And that wasn't even like, again, that's not me sitting here being like, I want to make a song for them. Mm-hmm. It was just like I was going through so much with somebody who I cared so much about yeah. that just naturally the result in the music is something that I feel a lot of women mm-hmm. will relate to. Okay, so it would be like the Teddy Pendergrass of Taps. Yeah, exactly. you know what? <laughs> I'll claim it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's so uh, where's the best place for people to keep up with you online, Leo? Yeah, so my website, www.leomanzari.com. That's L-E-O-M-A-N-Z-A-R-I.com. And Instagram Mm -hmm. is probably the main thing um, because that is a series of like videos and, you know, you'll be able to see who I collaborate with. And um, so, yeah, my website and Instagram. Sounds good. Dude, I just want to say I admire you, your attitude, your spirit. Like, I know you're going to like accomplish everything you want. Yeah, thank you, man. No doubt. For real. Thanks for having me, man. Sure, sure. And thank you for doing this. Absolutely. Take a walk with me. Let's go step outside. Fresh and desperately, at least that'll do you right. Take a walk with me. I know you're paralyzed, but that weakness in your knees is far too serious to hide. It's alright, it's alright. Don't slow down, move forward. Stand your ground, I know you. So peaceful, the waves just pass. And imagine if I drove here first where the reefs were. I'd bring a lot of baggage. Maybe this side stay afloat, stay afloat. Cause even the darkness turns to light. When you open your eyes, I back show the views a little different. It's funny when you see it from the bottom up. You got everything around you, but it's not enough. Cause all you had to give was a lot of love. I swear, since then you locked it up. Circle was flying in the bucket Take your life now and soar through the rubbish Cause getting on, getting on Something's having its way with your heart Crumbling at the weight of your thoughts Oh, I know ya Oh, I know ya Oh, I know ya I know ya You're so, 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 so Open now, look at our avoidance to be broken now. Living like reality is chosen now. Bitch, please, thought I'm at an in a go sit down. I can help but see my people broken now. Hope, please, go deep. You can hold it out, hold it out, hold it out. out. Huh. Hold it down, get the drink, pour it down. What a celebration for the dreams, couldn't afford it down. Evidently, the very things we hate, we couldn't go without. Holding down, and you know the flow that we going now. You showing how I see the hurt in your photos now. Picture perfect, it seem more worthless, I know the difference. You say it's fine, but I see the signs and they show you're living. I'm just saying, I admire what's inside. And it's something I don't think you gotta hide, no lie. Something's having its way with your heart. Crumbling at the weight of your thoughts.
You just heard On Your Mind from Clockwork by Leo Manzari. Make sure you keep up with him online at leomanzari.com and on Instagram at leomanzari. I am online at talkmusictalk.com for more podcast information and to stream every single episode. You can also find me on Instagram at this is boys and some call to actions for you. Please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, pretty much everywhere. Just search for Talk Music Talk and please leave a rating and or review wherever you happen to listen because it helps expose the show to brand new listeners. There is also a Talk Music Talk app. You can get that wherever you like to get apps. Just search for Talk Music Talk. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, and there will be a next time, this one's for you, Liz. 